This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. So my guest, my guest today is Eric Nessler. He's uh, currently a professor of neuroscience, psychiatry, and pharmacological sciences, director of the Friedman Brain Institute, and dean for academic and scientific affairs at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Um, Eric uh, did his PhD, work, well, MD and PhD at Yale, and he did residency there and up at McLean in Boston. And then, then you came back to Yale. Uh, and then you got recruited to University of Texas Southwestern to chair the uh, department there. Um, so I don't wanna to take too much more time to introduce you except to say that you're an author on what's considered the Bible of neurobiology and mental illness called Neurobiology of Mental Illness. There's been multiple editions. And uh, Dr. Nessler has received many awards uh, and he served on scientific advisory boards for the National Institute of Drug Abuse, on Drug Abuse, National Institute of Mental Health. And he was a president of Society for Neuroscience, the largest uh, group of neuroscientists that, that meet every year in the world. Okay, Eric, so your family, when you're growing up, did were your parents involved in science at all or medicine? Yeah, so my father was a biology teacher at uh, Martin Van Buren High School in New York City. And uh, my love for biology and uh, started with him. And uh, when I was a kid, he brought home a microscope and we looked at things under the microscope, insect wings, plants, and things like that. Uh, and then as I got older, we started doing some science experiments in the basement. You know, you know, when I think of high school kids today who come to our labs in Mount Sinai or other medical centers and use the most advanced technologies for their high school science fair projects, my science fair projects literally was done in the basement of our home with uh, low tech uh, approaches. And, uh, but, but uh, I, I got interested in biology and science from that early age due to my dad. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and do you have children? I do, I have three kids. They're 31 to 36. Uh -huh. And are any of them involved in science? Nope, our two boys were about as far away from it as possible. One's a lawyer and the other is a PhD in history. And uh, our daughter is a doctor, uh, a pediatrician in New York City, but, but not a scientist. Okay. Okay, Eric, so today you're gonna talk about uh, kind of the current state of understanding of alterations that occur in neural networks in the brain in addiction and depression. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what, what neural circuits are involved and kind of just go through kind of the general sequence of what may be happening? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the way we got into this was from some of my uh, clinical experiences where, for example, in, uh, when I meet uh, patients with addiction problems, um, they started taking drugs at a various point in their lifetime. But then as they took more and more drug, uh, the vulnerable folks uh, ended up showing behavioral changes. We label those changes as addiction and that last a lifetime. So a person might stop taking drug, you know, including alcohol or cocaine or heroin or, or, or other drugs. And even if they stop taking the drug for many months, sometimes many years, they would remain at increased risk to relapse to drug use when they hung out with a friend that they used to get high with, when they went to a bar or uh, a place where they used to take drug, um, it would stimulate drug use. And I was struck by the rapidity with which some individuals descended into the really dark phase of an addiction problem so quickly. Um, 
given years of, despite years of abstinence. And then um, by analogy with a chronic stress, uh, we know that a person's risk for depression uh, is determined heavily by the um, accumulation of stresses and traumas that people sustain over a lifetime. And so the idea once again is how is it that um, stress earlier in life can cause changes in the brain that make individuals at increased risk for stress later in life and for vulnerable people develop a problem like depression or another uh, syndrome. So the, the basic um, concept of my work is how does life experience, whether it's drug abuse or stress or other types of experiences, including positive experiences, how does life experience program the brain for a lifetime with stable changes that then persist for many years, perhaps decades? And we, to answer that question, we focus on parts of the brain. You use the term circuits. When you think of a brain as uh, being composed of nerve cells that communicate with one another like electrical circuits. So we, we focus on circuits in the front part of the brain that are sometimes referred to as the limbic regions of brain or the emotional centers of brain, parts of the frontal cortex, parts, uh, other brain regions like hippocampus, amygdala, nucleus accumbens. These are just words that describe regions of brain uh, and the derivation of the names is not important. So those are the circuits that we focus on, the connections between those brains. And really my lab has spent the last few decades trying to understand how does life experience change those circuits for a lifetime to uh, promote addiction in, on the one hand or depression. And addiction and depression are somewhat different than uh, from a genetic standpoint that say than Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, which is two disorders I worked on where there are certain gene mutations that if you have the mutation, you have a hundred percent chance of developing the disease. But with addiction and depression, such genes haven't been identified yet. Is that right? Yes, so the, the heritability of addiction and depression is actually pretty high. Uh, a lot of studies have shown that addiction risk is about 50% genetic or heritable. It's lower for depression, probably closer to 35%. But what's so uh, sobering about those numbers is that in both cases, many hundreds of genes might comprise that genetic risk so that each individual gene that's been identified contributes a minuscule percent to the overall risk, which makes it very hard to um, use that information to study the underlying biology or to leverage the information for clinical care. Yeah. And so go ahead and can you define the term epigenetics for, for our viewers? Sure. So epigenetics has several definitions. And I, I think that, let me start with the uh, classical definition and then uh, I'll define an alternative approach which is more akin to the way we are using the term today. So epigenetics was first introduced as a term that referred to the process by which random events occurred during development. So for the brain, for example, as an axon is growing. Uh, so the axon is, is a growth of one nerve cell growing in the brain, trying to find its target elsewhere in the brain, forming these circuits that we were talking about earlier. So as an axon is growing in the brain, it hits a point and it needs to turn left or right. And in some cases that might be a random event for that axon leading to the brains of two identical twins to be very different. So despite the fact that identical twins have identical uh, genes, uh, their brains could turn out to be very different. So in fact, we know that the gyri of the brains, uh, so the gyruses of brains are the folds and curves that one would see on the outside surface of a brain. Mm 
the pattern of gyri is different among identical twins, just like fingerprints are, are different among identical twins, despite identical genetics. So how it is that identical DNA can give rise to very different uh, function uh, was described as epigenetics. And um, what unfolded over the years was the biological basis of epigenetics, which turns out to be the way the DNA sequence is packaged in a cell nucleus. So DNA is composed of nucleotides uh, or bases, each uh, as a linear sequence of four different bases. Uh, a mammalian organism, a mouse or a human, has about 3 billion bases in its genome. If spread out linearly, 3 billion bases of DNA would be about two meters in length, about two yards in length. And somehow two yards of DNA fits in a microscopic cell nucleus. And that's in every cell in the body. So this is an extraordinary achievement of evolution to um, devise a manner in which two meters of DNA are folded uh, into, uh, are compacted and folded to such an extent. And it turns out that in beautiful biology that's been done by many labs over two decades now, it's been learned that the DNA uh, double helix is, is wrapped around uh, proteins called histones. And then the histone proteins with the DNA wrapped around them the term for that is a nucleosome. And then the individual nucleosomes are folded and compacted in, in very intricate ways. And that turns out to be very important functionally because the spans of DNA that are in highly folded regions of, of the chromatin, chromatin being the material inside of a cell nucleus, the spans of DNA in tightly folded regions of chromatin can't be functional. And it's only DNA in more open regions of chromatin where the DNA is itself is exposed that can then uh, be functional. Function of DNA is mostly to serve as a template for RNA. RNA is a template for protein, which then provides all the functions uh, in the body. And so uh, what happens during development with one uh, type of, a, with a fertilized egg, uh, as that egg divides, as the fertilized egg divides, it gives rise to many different cell types, a brain cell, a liver cell, a skin cell, because of the selective unfolding of chromatin and the activation of brain genes, liver genes, skin genes, and so on in, in the tissue. And the classic term of epigenetics is simply referring to the process by which two identical genomes can give rise to very different brains, livers, skin, even if people have identical uh, genomes. We've, the field has taken that further, and this is where we've uh, focused most of our work, into using epigenetics in a different way. And that is that even in adulthood, that these processes of DNA opening and closing, chromatin opening and closing continue throughout life. And so the idea back 15 or so years ago was that just as when a stem cell differentiates into a brain cell or liver cell, once that occurs, that's permanent. The idea was maybe life experiences result in similar types of changes in the brain, some of which are permanent. Going back to what I said at the outset, that a drug of abuse might produce some lasting changes in behavior in part through changing this opening and closing of chromatin, so-called epigenetics and same for stress with depression. Yeah, so there, there are chemicals, neurotransmitters that, uh that uh, are the molecules that mediate the communication between individual neurons that are synapse. For example, glutamate, an amino acid, is the most abundant and probably important <laughs> neurotransmitter in the brain. It's excitatory. And so when glutamate is released at a synapse, 
then in the opposite side of the synapse, the postsynaptic neuron, the calcium ion, calcium, moves in. And that can affect gene expression. That is, it can affect the amount of uh, activation state of a gene. And you, you worked a lot uh, early on on some of those events that are kind of preceding these changes in the nucleus, probably. You want to talk? Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So, just what you said is that uh, neurohormones or neurotransmitters mediate communication between nerve cells, and um, that communication is very rapid and gives the brain the ability to respond very quickly to uh, stimuli in the environment. What uh, my lab and other labs have noted also is that in parallel to these rapid effects are more slowly occurring adaptive effects. Mm -hmm. So every time glutamate is released by one nerve cell and acts on another nerve cell, it affects the activity of that other nerve cell immediately, but it also uh, triggers several events inside that second nerve cell that essentially change that nerve cell the next time glutamate is released onto it. And that's how the brain adapts over time, how we learn and remember things um, and uh, function uh, over time. Um, so the idea would be that among those more slowly occurring events triggered by glutamate would be changes in chromatin. Yeah. That glutamate signaling at the next second nerve cell produces chemical changes inside that nerve cell that eventually travel to the cell's nucleus and alter the structure of chromatin, opening some genes up, activating some genes, closing down or inhibiting other genes and changing that nerve cell over time. Now we haven't mentioned dopamine yet and I probably mm -hmm. the, the viewers are saying, wow, they're talking, Dr. Nessler is talking about addiction and he hasn't mentioned dopamine, but why don't you talk a little bit about dopamine and, and this CREB, this, this mm -hmm. uh, transcription factor that's activated probably the synapse and then goes to the nucleus and... Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, yeah, so first of all, dope, you know, glutamate is one of probably 100 neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, there are many important ones that control these limbic circuits. Uh, another example of an important neurotransmitter in these limbic circuits is dopamine. Dopamine has become uh, popularized because it is viewed as being very important for reward. So drugs of abuse would increase the release of dopamine in reward centers of the brain, which is thought to be a major mechanism, not the only mechanism, but a major mechanism by which they produce their rewarding and addicting effects. But we know that dopamine plays an analogous role for bad things in the environment as well and signals to the brain when something negative, aversive happens like stress or trauma and something else. So dopamine is one of a series of transmitters that uh, play an important role in controlling emotional responses in the brain, but very much integrated with glutamate and other major neurotransmitters. Uh, you mentioned CREB. CREB is an example of a protein called a transcription factor. Transcription factors bind to DNA and control the activity of the genes to which they bind. So for example, CREB might bind to one gene and activate that gene, turn that gene on by opening chromatin and allowing the DNA to serve as a template for RNA, protein, and, and an increase in some function mediated by that target protein. The way CREB is activated is by these neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters act on the surface of uh, nerve cells on proteins called receptors. The receptors are connected to a complex array of post-receptor signaling proteins um, that control levels of molecules like calcium, as you mentioned, or cyclic AMP, but many, many other types of intracellular signals. And it's those intracellular signals that then actually enter the cell nucleus where they 
chemically activate CREB. Uh, and then uh, that leads to CREB's activity on a gene and the downstream effects I described. You, uh, your PhD work, uh, graduate work was with the late Paul Gringard, who was a Nobel laureate and a uh, he's one of the, the most intelligent people I've ever met, I think, and he's very kind. And But your early work with Paul was on, on some of these early events that are occurring after the synapses are activated. And um, Paul essentially, his major work was he really worked out the importance of, of a modification of proteins called phosphorylation. Mm -hmm. in, in all these signaling events that are occurring. Right. So you've got different, all sorts of different proteins. You mentioned uh, neurotransmitter receptors. Well, they can have a, a phosphate removed or added to them. Mm -hmm. And in the nucleus, you mentioned these chromatin changes, mm -hmm. you know, and are there kind of analogous molecular changes that are actually occurring that lead to these enduring, maybe permanent changes you're, you're, you're thinking are happening in, in certain circuits during addiction in, in people with addiction. Yes, absolutely. First, let me make a personal comment on Paul, uh, who uh, I, I was a graduate student in his lab many years ago. You know, we're talking close to 40 years ago. And Paul was like a father to me and remained a mentor, uh, you know, uh, until he passed away just a few years ago. Um, but Paul did revolutionize biology by demonstrating the involvement of protein phosphorylation as a major currency. Um, hold on a second, I'm getting a Zoom signal here. Yep, okay, good. Um, the um, uh, showing that protein phosphorylation is a major cellular mechanism for information transfer. In fact, some colleagues of, of mine and I have started referring to these as green guard cascades uh, because Paul really was the one who um, demonstrated their importance. And I'll say from a personal note, when I was applying for uh, residency programs, for example, um, after my graduate work, and this was in the early 80s, going around the country at some of our nation's best departments of neuroscience, I was struck with a lot of skepticism about the Green Guard cascades of people who just did not believe that neural function could be controlled by these types of biochemical processes, that adding a phosphate group to a protein would just be too slow to have any influence on brain function. And boy, were those people wrong and Paul was right. And I, you know, I think it's important to appreciate that today's students now learn about these green guard cascades as if they're second nature and obvious truths. Uh, but it was in our lifetime that that was not widely held. So an important lesson uh, about the sociology of, of science. Yeah, and, and Paul is a very humble man. He I think he wouldn't have been terribly disappointed if he didn't get a Nobel Prize. It's, it's, you know, and there are certain instances where Nobel Prize is kind of contentious and people got to get upset, but Paul's a very humble guy. Yeah. So anyway, going back to the, the uh, details of your question, the, um, the, chem the way that CREB is activated, in fact, is through its phosphorylation. Uh, by enzymes called protein kinases. And there are several types of protein kinases that respond to glutamate and other neurotransmitter signals that travel to the nucleus where those protein kinases then add phosphate groups to CREB and control CREB's activity. The chromatin biology field took, that, um, took those discoveries further by showing that first of all, histone proteins are also phosphorylated Many other types of chromatin proteins that regulate the packing of DNA are regulated by phosphorylation. But they went beyond that to show that proteins, histone proteins are also modified uh, 
by other types of chemical modifications. So adding methyl groups called methylation, adding acetyl groups called acetylation and, and so on, many different types of modifications. Elaborating very detailed pathways by which the addition of a methyl group or an acetyl group to a particular part of a histone protein alters the activity of the nearby DNA by opening and closing the chromatin. Uh, so that has been the basis of epigenetic regulation over the past couple of decades. And then it was discovered also that the DNA itself can be chemically modified. An example would be by the addition of methyl groups or DNA methylation also controlling the opening and closing of chromatin. So these are very complicated processes. You know, uh, um, a mammalian organism has, you know, maybe on the order of 25,000 genes, plus or minus. Um, and it's likely that a thousand of those genes just contribute to chromatin regulation. Oh, wow. And that when a single gene is activated, say in response to a glutamate signal on a nerve cell, that in order for that glutamate signal to activate one gene, there may be more than a hundred proteins that accumulate in the vicinity of that gene to orchestrate its activation. So, so you know, it, it, it again, just to emphasize the extraordinary accomplishment of evolution yeah. for these processes to be worked out in eukaryotic cells, or these are cells from yeast onward that have a cell nucleus. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, go ahead. So how do, you, how do you study these mechanisms in the laboratory? You mainly use rats and mice, is that right? Yep, uh, the, the work involves studies in rats and mice where we have the animals exposed to drugs of abuse or stress. We always validate our findings in mouse models, mouse or rat models by looking at human brain tissue. So I want to underscore the importance of that. This involves having people or their loved ones donate brains upon death uh, to study. Uh, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why progress in psychiatry has lagged behind progress in other medical fields in cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, dermatology, and so on. It's possible to obtain biopsies of a disease tissue yeah. and study the disease mechanisms in our patients. We can't do that in psychiatry. We don't have access to our patients' brains, nor, nor could we. And uh, the only access we have is after death, where those brains provide an incredibly valuable opportunity to ensure that what we're studying in the mouse and rat models are relevant to the human condition. Yeah. So the tools we use are now called things like RNA sequencing or chip sequencing. What this means is that you take a piece of brain from a mouse, rat, or human, and you can isolate a specific type of cell from the clump of tissue. So any clump of brain tissue contains many different types of cells, many types of nerve cells, but also many types of non-nerve cells. Yeah. And we know that the type of regulation that occurs is very different in one type of cell versus another. So it's important to do this on a cell type specific manner. So we can use these, um, so we isolate the cells and then we uh, isolate RNA or chromatin from clusters of cells and perform sequencing. That means just sequencing the RNA or sequencing the DNA and identifying um, the specific regions of the genome that are involved. So for example, for RNA, RNA sequencing would, would uh, involve perhaps obtaining 100 million short sequences derived from the RNA, which the computer then aligned to a genome to tell us which portions of the genome were activated to synthesize those RNAs. Yeah. 
that's RNA sequencing. For mm -hmm. chip sequencing, we would say, for example, if we're interested in the role of a type of histone methylation in controlling the expression of genes, we would take chromatin from a type of cell and we would apply an antibody that recognizes that type of histone methylation. We would thereby isolate all of the segments of chromatin that have that histone modification, do DNA sequencing, again, obtain 100 million short DNA sequences and use a computer to tell us which regions of the genome have that chemical modification of histones associated with them. And through that type of analyses, which as you can imagine, involves literally terabytes of sequencing data. So uh, a million million uh, sequencing data points um, to um, derive information of how exposure to cocaine or exposure to a type of stress in one cell type in one brain region is altering chromatin structure and gene expression. And once you identify a, a change in the chromatin specific change, molecular change, and that's associated with a change in gene expression, that's different in a cocaine addicted rat versus one not, is there a way to, to establish cause effect relationship between that particular molecular modification and the actual behavioral manifestation of being addicted? Yes, absolutely. So that's essential because everything I've described thus far is really correlative. Yeah. And if we do this, if we perform this work on human brain tissue, um, that's where animal models become imperative yeah. because the ability to manipulate genes and study consequences has to be done in an animal, can't be done in a human. Uh, so the, I, the, the algorithm we use in the laboratory is to use advanced bioinformatics, taking these terabytes of data, having the uh, the um, bioinformatics guide us uh, toward the strongest correlations. Gene X in this cell type is the most heavily correlated with an addiction score or a depression score in a human or a uh, animal. Then the next step would be to develop tools to manipulate that gene specifically in that cell type in an animal model and study the downstream consequences. And so we've done that, other labs have done that for many genes now, where we can develop what are called viral vectors. So these are types of viruses where we put in the, ab put in the gene of interest or put in a tool to inhibit the gene of interest. We inject the virus into the brain of an animal and we target it to a specific cell type using other types of molecular tools. And so now we have an animal with that either mimics, for example, higher levels of expression of gene X in one cell type in one brain region, or another animal with a different virus where we have an animal where that animal can no longer show an increase in gene X in response to cocaine or stress. Mm -hmm. And we can then study, does the uh, animal that already has higher levels of expression of gene X, does that show an increase in addiction or depression-like behavior? And conversely, if for the animal where we prevent the drug or stress-induced increase, can we prevent the development yeah. of addiction yeah. or depression-like behavior? Yeah. And then once we have that finding, we can study all the elements in between, how it is that altered levels of a gene change the functioning of that one type of cell, change the functioning of the circuit in which that one cell functions uh, to alter the behavioral output of the brain. Now, in the, in the case of, you know, I don't know that much about the addiction field, but in the case of depression, there is quite a bit of evidence for 
one particular gene being important, and that's the gene that encodes a protein called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic yeah. factor. Could, could you talk a little bit about BDNF and depression? Because I think it's, that's an interesting story. Sure, absolutely. So BDNF, as you said, is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's basically a nerve growth factor. It was discovered many years ago as one of the many uh, proteins in the brain that serves as a growth factor for the growth of nerve cells and is required during development for the healthy uh, uh, construction of the brain's cells and circuits. What we and other groups found over the years, and some of this work was done with a dear colleague and friend of mine, Ron Duman, yeah. with whom I worked for many years at Yale and died tragically at too young an age a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic. But what we and others have shown is that BDNF is very much involved in controlling an animal's responses to stress. So not only during development, but now you have a fully differentiated adult brain and BDNF in some brain regions is required to promote adaptive responses to stress, helping an animal cope with stress. Whereas in other brain regions, that BDNF can have deleterious consequences. It actually impedes an animal's coping ability and promotes susceptibility to stress. And so we are, we and others have been very interested. Uh, one of my former postdocs, Lisa Montegia, has done some beautiful work uh, looking at uh, BDNF uh, in these stress models. Uh, we are very interested in understanding how BDNF controls the activity of nerve cells in these different parts of the brain in different ways, leading to the different outcomes of stress. Now, one, one powerful antidepressant is exercise. And yes. I've experienced this myself. A couple of years ago, I had a mountain bike accident. I, you know, prior to then, I was a trail runner, mountain bike. I had three surgeries. I, you know, I couldn't do any exercise for a while. Mm -hmm. I actually got depressed. Mm -hmm. And Exercise, if you take a rat or mice and put running wheels in the, its cage, BDNF levels go up actually a lot in some brain regions, like yes. the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory. Mm -hmm. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's some evidence that the most commonly prescribed antidepressant drugs increase BDNF levels and that there's some evidence maybe that increase in BDNF is important for the antidepressant effect. Absolutely. So that is in the brain area called the hippocampus, as you say, maybe the same in prefrontal cortex, that uh, the ability of stress or some available antidepressants to induce uh, BDNF function, it contributes to their antidepressant activity in humans. And where there are uh, human data to support that hypothesis, which was all derived from animal models. You, you raise exercise, which is a really good point. There's no question that good physical exercise and good nutrition can enhance a person's stress resilience to a tremendous extent. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the things that we always work with our patients on to make sure that they are using these non-medication approaches to the best of their ability. Yeah. And many still need medications to get better, but it's always a good idea to start with the basics. And physical exercise has uh, tremendous robust positive effects on our well-being, me uh, mentally and physically. This leads to to kind of considering the, the implications of the, the work on these epigenetic, these enduring modifications in gene expression as a result of these chromatin changes in the nucleus, uh, implications for risk reduction and treatment for addiction and depression. Is there what are your thoughts on that? And kind of what do you see the future of this in terms of therapeutic approaches? 
Yeah, so, you know, there, uh, until very recently, the range of antidepressants that we had available to use to help people really hadn't changed. So when I was in psychiat psychiatry training back in the late uh, 1980s, we had a range of antidepressants. And for most of my career, that range had not changed. The SSRI antidepressants, exemplified by fluoxetine or Prozac, were really minor modifications over older antidepressants that I had available to me during my training that in turn were introduced to the field two decades before my training. So for half a century, there had not been appreciable advances. And then all of a sudden, what seemed like all of a sudden, actually depending on decades of research, but uh, in 2019, two uh, drugs were approved by the FDA for the treatment of depression. So one was ketamine and the other was brexanolone. Ketamine was approved uh, as a treatment for, for uh, what, what's called treatment resistant depression, people who don't get better with standard antidepressants. And brexanolone was approved for the treatment of postpartum depression. And both of those drugs act on very different molecules in the brain than all of the other standard antidepressants. All of the other standard antidepressants act on what we call monoamines, serotonin, or norepinephrine, whereas glutamate is, uh, whereas ketamine is thought to act on glutamate and brexanolone on what are called ne neurosteroids, uh, different types of chemical messengers in the brain. And this embarked, uh, this, these, uh, the FDA approval of these molecules has triggered ferocious interest now in further leveraging the range of basic studies that have been performed over the past couple of decades on an increased knowledge of the biology of stress responses and antidepressant treatment. So we now have a whole range of proteins in the brain that could serve as novel drug targets, uh, including chromatin proteins. And that is a novel idea of treating depression with a uh, molecule that acts in the cell nucleus um, on histone proteins or other chromatin regulatory proteins to control the opening and closing of DNA but it is a very viable hypothesis that is now being tested clinically. The trick is to come up with molecules that, have, uh, that are safe and that don't produce side effects in the rest of the body and can produce a clinically useful effect on the brain. Now, ketamine was developed as an anesthetic and then there was this research showing that low doses mm -hmm. uh, can have an antidepressant effect. And What's interesting to me is that ketamine and PCP, which is actually a, a, a drug of abuse in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, they can induce like altered states of consciousness, kind of hallucinations even. And now there's, in parallel, there's this work with psychedelics, right? Yes. Which, which clearly you know, can cause hallucinations and suggesting there's some work at Johns Hopkins here where I'm at. Yes. You know, showing clinically, and I think up in New York too, that, that uh, psychedelics, uh, one time even treatment with psychedelics can have long lasting antidepressant effect. So what are you, are you exposing animals to these and then looking at the chromatin modifications? Yes, very much so. So one of the interesting things is the ability of ketamine and perhaps psychedelic drugs, which are drugs like LSD and uh, psilocybin and related molecules to produce lasting antidepressant effects. One hypothesis would be is that those lasting effects are mediated or sustained by the types of changes in chromatin that we've been yeah. discussing. Yeah. So that is very much a hypothesis uh, that we're interested in and others are interested in. The, um, the ketamine data are particularly interesting because what the ketamine studies showed is that it's possible to have a person who is severely depressed and not getting better in response to a range of other approaches, 
being given a single dose of ketamine and showing a dramatic response within hours. And we never saw that with standard antidepressants. I mean, we, most people know that if you take fluoxetine or Prozac or any other standard antidepressant, most people need to take that medication for many weeks, maybe sometimes many months before a full antidepressant response is seen. And here, all of a sudden, investigators showed uh, that if you give individuals a single dose of ketamine, you can produce that positive response within hours. The trick then is to maintain that response either with repeated dosing of ketamine every few days or, or through other means. So one question is how does ketamine produce rapid responses? Yeah. Not probably not through chromatin, right? That is more related to the circuitry aspects of the brain that we've been talking about, like glutamate function. But then what is sustaining their effects for several days and um, that is, um, and that could well be through chromatin. Now, in terms of the psychedelics, there's been, as I mentioned, ferocious interest. I, I have never seen as much interest from venture capital and biotech circles in a psychiatric approach than I've seen in the last few years for the possible utility of psychedelics in the treatment of depression or other trauma related disorders. And it's important for the listeners to know that the data to substantiate the efficacy of those molecules remains limited. There are definitely some positive studies at Hopkins, as you mentioned, in the UK, in New York, and many other centers around the world, but still very limited. So okay. we need to have a lot more yeah. uh, clinical trials being done rigorously to ensure the safety and efficacy of the psychedelics. But that's just an empirical question, right? We just need to see yeah. if they work and if they do perform some of the analogous studies, as I mentioned with ketamine to figure out how it is that they are producing their positive effects. Well, the good news is finally that uh, clinicians are able to use these yes. drugs, right? That's right? For a long time, they essentially were banned or you couldn't get That's them. right. It was very difficult to even perform research on the drugs in animals with some of these yeah. molecules, yeah. Uh, let alone giving them to humans experimentally. Yeah. Now, at the beginning of, uh, of your, your talk about this, discussion about this, you talked about individual differences in susceptibility to addiction or depression and... Um, are there also sex differences, uh, male-female yeah. differences? Yep, one of the, the lessons of the last several years has been dramatic sex differences at the molecular level. You know, as a trained psychiatrist, I would say that for the most part, at, at least as a starting principle, that the syndromes of depression and addiction are very similar in men and women, boys and girls. Um, but what there are minor differences that have been studied over the years, but for the most part, they're, they're quite similar. And they respond similarly to, uh, for, in the case of depression, to standard antidepressants. One of the surprising findings then in the last few years is that when we and other groups looked at postmortem brain tissue of people who died with depression, for example, that the gene expression abnormalities associated with depression in depressed men versus normal men were mostly different compared with the gene expression abnormalities found in depressed women compared to normal women. Huh. And that principle has now been replicated by many other groups, many other, um, in many other contexts, so that the general principle that's evolving is that the behavioral features of many neurological and psychiatric syndromes might be quite similar between men and women. But when you look at the detailed molecular mechanisms that are going awry in men and women, differences predominate. And it does, and I, I believe that now that that has been established with certainty. And it does mean then that the challenge to the pharmaceutical industry and the academic uh, enterprise that supports the pharmaceutical industry in basic discoveries is to elaborate a path 
of drug discovery that is sex specific. So the idea of there being treatments for depression or addiction that would only work in men or others that only work in women. And that's a sea change for the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I think now one that is now fully justified based on available evidence, not only in animals, but in humans. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, I can't remember at what point, but at one point the NIH essentially kind of demanded that people get funding from NIH do experiments in both males and females because for, well, before that, most people focused on males because they said, well, they don't have estrus cycles, so we don't have to worry about like these variations in hormones and so on. And that, that definitely probably led to missing a lot of important uh, sex differences in various aspects of yeah. biology. Yeah, uh, no, you know, no question. So when I was in medical school, almost all clinical trials involved men only. Oh. Uh, and until NIH mandated, and I forget when they gave the mandate uh, a couple of decades ago, yeah. that any clinical trial performed with NIH funding has to include men and women. Yeah. Where, where appropriate, obviously, if you're studying a sex specific illness, uh, then, then not. Um, but, it, but NIH left untouched the world of basic science. And so my lab studied for the first few decades that we were in existence, male rats and mice only, yeah. probably 90 plus percent. We rarely looked at females and the field would justify that by saying, oh, it's just too complicated to study two sexes. You have to double the number of animals. Oh, wait, it's even more complicated than that because females have an estrous cycle. So you need to study several groups of females ignoring the fact that there are cycles in male animals also, that was just invisible yeah. to, to the field. Yeah. Um, and they came up, NIH came up with a mandate probably about 10 years ago now, I'm thinking, to also include yeah. sex as a biological variable. So anytime now NIH funding is used to study something in an animal model or a cell model, that animal or cell has to uh, represent both sexes. Yeah. And the result of it has been an extraordinary amount of interesting biology, revealing these unpredicted, unexpected, dramatic sex differences uh, across the brain, across brain disorders uh, that were never anticipated. Yeah. Eric, let's finish up by, so you've, you've described these uh, enduring changes that occur within an in individual. Mm -hmm. And there's this very interesting findings in animals suggesting that certain of these molecular changes in chromatin and, and changes in gene expression can actually be transferred across generations. And yeah. the idea there is that the life experiences of, of a mom or pop, you know, before they got together and had fertilized egg, can somehow lead to enduring changes in the sperm or the egg. Mm -hmm. and, and actually there's pretty strong evidence for that from my reading in the literature in animals, for example, with even models of depression, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so this is now going back to the original definition of epigenetics that I had given at the outset. Um, the idea of a life experience being passed on to the next generation, of course, was debunked, you know, 250 years ago by Lamarck in France that, you know, that the inheritance is mediated by DNA. And when something happens to a human, you know, the gross example given that if I have my arm cut off and then procreate, my children will be born with two arms, not one arm. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that sort of just taking it to the extreme. Yeah. But there's, there's no question that there have been an increasing number of robust examples where life experiences are passed on to subsequent generations. For example, in different parts of the world where people experienced famine, children and grandchildren show metabolic changes. So that's two generations 
uh, away. Yeah. Uh, for the Holocaust, for example, during World War II, Holocaust survivors have been reported to have children, even grandchildren, with some behavioral differences compared to everyone else. The real question is mechanism. Yeah. And the question is whether life experience really, whether life experiences produces these changes by producing changes in, uh, produces changes in behavior and metabolism through changes in sperm or egg cell or through behavioral transmission. Sure. So if I'm a Holocaust victim, I'm likely going to be raising my children with a different viewpoint of the world uh, than other neighbors. And they, they may raise their children with different viewpoints than their comparators and so on. In hard to decipher in uh, humans, easier to decipher in animals. Yeah. So there's been now an increasing number of studies that you have an animal give itself uh, cocaine or heroin. And then you look at children and grandchildren of those animals. And there are some differences in drug related behavior of those animals. Likewise, uh, we've done and others have done some experiments that if you expose animals to chronic stress and then have them procreate, their children and grandchildren do show different susceptibility to stress. It's, there's a lot less evidence and those changes are robust, no question about it. Okay. The, it's been a lot harder to demonstrate that the sperm or egg cells are oh. the active ingredient in that transmission. So there are some data to suggest that the transmission is behavioral, even in a mouse, that a mouse that's been uh, treated with heroin is um, that self-administered heroin is raising its pups differently. So that's a behavioral change, not necessarily mediated through changes in its egg cells. Uh, no, likewise. The, the changes could also in some instances be occurring during development in the womb. Uh, yes, for example, with, with autism, there's some evidence that women uh, with obesity or type 2 diabetes during pregnancy, there's an increased risk for uh, a child, one of their child's uh, falling on the spectrum. Right. Yeah. So this is, I mean, I'll give you an example of one study. I think it's the only example that's been done to date. I, I could be wrong about that, but Dina Walker who's now at Oregon and Ashley Cunningham who's a graduate student of ours at Mount Sinai, published a paper about a year ago showing that if you take a mouse, male mouse that's been stressed chronically and take its sperm or take the sperm from a normal mouse, have a female mouse procreate with a normal mouse, but one that's vasectomized. So there's no, uh, there's no, uh, fertilization of, of uh, egg cells, and then artificially inseminate that female mouth with sperm from a stressed father or a control father, okay. right? So the only difference are the sperm cells. Yeah. We were able to show subtle differences in behavior of the offspring. Huh. So to us, that provides the best evidence. Yeah that the sperm cells can be the active ingredient in mediating some of this transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. The real question now, and it's a big question that's hard to answer, how is it that an alteration in sperm changes a fertilized egg, changes the generation from a fertilized egg to a multicellular embryo Leading to changes in one part of the brain controlling stress susceptibility. How does that happen? Right. And so we still have extremely little insight into that mechanism. And until we do, I think we just have to have a healthy grain of salt about these transgenerational epigenetic. Yeah, it doesn't, ideas. it doesn't, it's hard to imagine. You'd have to imagine some systemic alteration associated with the the problems in the brain or some signal coming from the brain to the sperm. And right. You know, nothing obvious pops to mind. 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, but definitely, I think uh, the standpoint of being healthy, uh, particularly women, uh, you know, when they become pregnant, it's very important. Of course, you know, basic, basic, uh, commonsensical approaches yeah. to life of good exercise, healthy nutrition, yeah. trying to control and reduce one's stress in life, uh, learning how to cope with stress. Obviously, as we've learned during the pandemic, sometimes stress is inevitable. Yeah. So learning how to develop one's own resilience to stress, which can be trained, can be learned, yeah. uh, is our important life lessons to yeah. uh, help us adapt to what life brings to yeah. us. Therapy definitely benefits a lot of people. Yep. 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 Okay, Eric, I've enjoyed uh, talking with you and learning about your work on epigenetics and addiction and depression. It's fascinating and uh, look forward to seeing what happens in the future with this. Thanks so much, Mark. It's been great talking with you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.